Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? In the back, can you hear me? You can come closer. Maybe it's better to be like really close to each other and hear each other well. It's a bit funny to, to have this background noise around us, but I'll try to be as fluent as possible. Uh, my name is Annabella Luca, and I'll be your host today. And I'll be talking about how to scale our businesses internationally, how to approach the global markets by using digital solutions. Uh, we at, at Lemonade are a digital marketing agency that provides solutions for mid-size and large businesses in terms of promoting on Google, on Facebook, um, LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, Instagram, Snapchat, Reddit, you know, all, all this uh, wide range of, of platforms. And uh, today I'll be talking mostly about tech products because we've been having expertise with, uh, with such kinds of, uh, um, of products, but not, not only. Um, I'll kindly ask you if you have a question to raise your hand and address it so everyone uh, in here can hear it. I can share the mic with you. Um, I don't want it to be like a monologue for the rest 50 minutes. So uh, let's try to, to build this workshop together and uh, take as many ideas as possible back home and implement them into our campaigns. Okay? Who's in with me? Yay! Okay. Uh, a few things about uh, the agency. We started seven years ago back in Sibiu. You know, Sibiu is like a small city that's not really digitally uh, uh, well known uh, to, to many people. Uh, we have our president from Sibiu and uh, we also started the, the agency because um, before I, uh, I was working in an American company for three years, I learned to use these tools like Google Ads, Facebook Ads and so on. And I started the agency. Uh, then we developed to Bucharest, and since last year we have an office also here in, in Cluj. So if you want to drink a lemonade, my colleagues here can assist you and talk about digital solutions. Ever since 2012, we've been handling uh, tens of thousands of campaigns, both in Google and in Facebook mostly, but we are using also other platforms. Uh, feel free to discuss whatever platform you have in mind and see what expertise we have in that field. Some of our clients, both Romanian and international. Um, on the international market, we have been gathering expertise for the last three years or so um, in countries like the US, the UK, uh, the marginal countries like Hungary, Bulgaria, Moldova, Poland and also the Western countries. Uh, we also ran campaigns in Chinese, Japanese. If you feel fancy about those uh, areas, we can discuss m in more detail. Uh, when thinking about uh, e-commerce, um, the numbers are, are looking pretty good. Uh, the estimates are that by 2020, we will be having about $1 trillion spend in cross-border um, e-commerce. That means, you know, people buying from other countries different stuff. Why do we do cross-borders? Here are some of the, the reasons. And number one would be the payment security. The platforms that we access, like Amazon, like eBay, are pretty safe in terms of payments. Uh, the cost of shipping is included um, in the order, usually, because I get this question a lot of times, whether to display or not uh, separately the shipping costs. It's really good to be transparent about all these costs. Um, up then the third reason would be clear policy retur about returns. Okay, that's the main concern for uh, the users. And um, addressing this straightforward would be a good um, endorsement and reassurance for your clients to uh, make a purchase. Besides, uh, besides these uh, good vibes, let's say, uh, there are also some fears behind e-commerce cross-borders. And the main fear would be high shipping costs, you know, especially for larger products, 
that are boxed in you know larger um, uh, packages you get larger costs and this puts a lot of pressure on the final price of that product if you've been attending these Amazon trainings that are really trending right now you've seen that the um, the best practices would be to have like a small product with a small package you know that includes very small shipping costs so that it makes um, it makes it interesting to your clients to buy okay and um, another fear that's on the second place but it's really really close to to the first one uh, would be the um, delivery time you know because clients don't have patience they want the product to be shipped as uh, fast as possible and as cheap as possible uh, and this actually uh, developed different solutions, especially in terms of uh, cost reduction. For instance, we've, we have worked with a business that is called eShop We Drop that really helps cut on the um, shipping expenses. For instance, uh, you're here in Cluj and you're browsing on Amazon UK and you want to buy a product that doesn't ship to Romania or that product is actually really costly for, for it to be shipped to Romania, you can actually ship it to a UK address and from there, once a week, they actually ship all these products that are ordered. They are shipped to, uh, to Romania, to their warehouse, and from there, a regular uh, courier will take it to your home uh, at a fraction of a cost. Okay, if it regularly costs like 10 or 15 pounds, this can cost two or three pounds. So it makes a really, really big difference. So cutting down on shipping costs would be a huge aspect into um, cross-border traffic. Okay, one second. Okay. What do people buy online uh, when we talk about cross borders? Uh, most of them are about clothing and accessories. Who has been, who in this room has ever bought a clothing, an accessory, a jewel or anything? Cross borders, okay. Was it Amazon? Was it uh, AliExpress? Okay, pretty equal. Any other platforms? ASOS, okay. eBay, okay. Same thing, okay. Sports Direct, okay. Yeah, so it's a whole range of websites that actually uh, deliver cross borders and as you can see, they're part of our lives and it's important to understand their, their business model. Secondly, amazing for me when I saw this stat was books, media and video games. I would assume it's more the video games than the books, <laughs> but you can disagree with me. Um, it's a quite a, an important uh, uh, range. And on the third place, it would be computer hardware and software, you know, and which brings us to the topic of the day because most of you are working in this area. So being the third in terms of volumes and talking about trillions of dollars, it's really a high potential and it's important to, to tap into that together. Okay, what are the main challenges when we are trying to scale a tech product? Uh, first of all, who in this room has been running or has ever run a campaign on a different market than Romania? Hands up. Okay, two persons. Where? Moldova. Okay. And? Moldova and US. Okay. Was it very different than Romania? Yes. In what terms? Language, culture, preferences. Okay, I've included some of the main, um, the main challenges that we've encountered so far in our um, campaigns. 
One would be localization. Okay, even if we are talking about a tech product, uh, some countries actually do prefer to have a local feel of that product. And here I'm talking uh, about markets like Italy, markets like Germany, markets like France, that prefer to have a landing page or um, the ad to be written in their home language. It's more about trust building, it gets a better conversion rate. Um, it also helps if you have uh, customer support in that language, you know, because they want to have either a pre-sale or a post-sale support. Some products actually require, you know, more, more uh, technical inquiries or um, if we're talking about lead generation, for instance, if you want to buy a, a whole suite of uh, Microsoft products, okay, you get a salesperson who you talk to in order to find your, uh, your best product fit. Okay, customer support. It's really, really important we, when we are doing business in other, other markets to have customer support in that language and on that time zone. We've seen this for our US, uh, our US uh, clients. If we don't provide support within those working hours, then um, the business is not growing as it should be. And we, don't, uh, we, we cannot actually get client feedback uh, as quickly and um, as importantly as we should. Another thing would be laws and regulations. Different markets have different laws. You can see also this uh, GDPR rule that came to Europe that does not apply to America. So um, it actually restricted a lot Google and Facebook, uh, the way it's, it's working in this, um, in this geographic area. So taking in account all the laws and the regulations that affect our own business, it's really important when deciding on which markets to tap when scaling our product. Last but not least, customer behavior. As, uh, as your colleague said, um, it's really important to understand the behaviors of those users in the specific markets where we are um, advertising because it can feel differently. Even if Moldova is really similar to us, it's not the same, okay? It's not the same in terms of costs. For instance, the cost per click is much lower in Moldova than it is in Romania. The volumes of the markets are really different, okay? So if we get, then let's say 1,000 clients a month in Romania, we cannot expect that in day one in Moldova, okay? Also the Moldovan language, even though it's really similar to Romanian, it's not quite the same. I know we, we tried to create some videos with a Moldovan agency and it was really, really funny how they expressed their uh, their language and we also have Moldovan colleagues within the agency and sometimes they talk really funny even though it seems like Romanian it's not actually you know Romanian so um, ask for feedback when it comes to customer behavior use the online tools that um, tap into the quality and the quantity of the traffic okay for quantity Quantitative uh, challenges, we have Google Analytics, but for uh, quality traffic, we have other tools like Crazy Egg, like heat maps, and so on and so forth, that can actually help us understand what is going on on that specific market and how people tap into our product. Um, I would say, just to give you an example, how different, um, different, different people see the product, for instance, for uh, freemium products, um, we get a lot of traffic for the free stuff in Asia, India, China, okay? People love the free stuff, but when it comes to actually taking the wallet out and paying for that product, it's not likely to happen. While in the US, for instance, um, they are really looking into the value they can get from that product, not necessarily if it's free or not. 
So they are willing to pay if they see the right value in your product. Okay, this brings us to really different approaches for different markets. Because, for instance, in the US, even if it's a very costly market with a very high competition, for us as business people, it makes more sense to invest in there and to really try to deliver the value that we create because the likelihood to have a large lifetime customer value and to get money in is higher than in India or Asia or Asia Pacific. Does it make sense? Yeah? Okay. Next. Oh, sorry. So when it comes to, to scaling a process, a, a product, uh, automation is something that we need to keep in mind. So looking at our product and trying to understand everything that can be automated is a huge factor because it, what it does, it actually can cut down on costs and help us support the business on the long run. Many tech uh, founders think about the technical stuff of the product, which is great, but they, they leave behind the, the marketing side. You know, and they end up with a great product, they end up with great features, but they don't save the money for marketing and they have this product that nobody knows about. And it's not so good at the end of the day because even if word of mouth and um, different referral programs can really help out, at the end of the day, it's not gonna scale as fast as possible. And here, it can, we can talk about marketing automation. There are a, very, a, a wide variety of tools out there. Um, we can talk about processes and the way we do business besides the technical stuff. Okay, so I'm, I'm not just talking about technical stuff here. Product updates. That's an important thing to consider, you know, especially if we are tapping into more uh, developed markets. Um, it's really, really important to be uh, ahead, ahead of the curve of the, you know, the flow and the industry, because otherwise we might end up with an obsolete product that, uh, you know, just a challenger came and took over and we are out of business. Another major thing that we have uh, discovered in our campaigns is been A-B testing. And when I talk about A-B testing, it's about A-B testing landing pages where we drive traffic to. It's been making a lot of difference. Uh, if we use a regular presentation page or a sales page where we collect leads, where we encourage people to um, subscribe to our newsletter, where we encourage people to uh, use our referral program, or um, you know, use different features or create a free account. Okay, so I highly encourage you to invest in an A-B testing tool and really see the differences between how landing pages perform because they can actually provide a two times or three times better ROI for your marketing budget. Okay, Dave, yes, please. Uh, can you tell us, I mean, can you give us an example of A-B testing that worked best for you? Okay, so talking about uh, landing pages. Um, I can give you the most recent example. Uh, we've been working with a um, uh, business um, who has uh, de developed a tool of creating websites. Okay, they have a free version and then there's a paid version with some extra benefits. And they had the, the regular website um, as landing page. And then we created a separate sales page uh, that actually contained a tagline, you know, like the, the main USB, uh, a hero image, and uh, the main button with a call to action like uh, um, sign up for free, I think it was. Okay, and then once you scroll down the page, you had the benefits of using that tool. Then we had the um, testimonials 
we have like four or five testimonials of uh, businesses that have used this, uh, this kind of tool. Um, we had also um, PR articles, you know, like taglines from PR articles, not the whole article. And uh, for each screen, we used a call to action, okay? So once the person is scrolling down, they need to see what we want them to do, like signing, signing up for, for free. And we tried to see if the main website and the landing page, what was the difference in terms of conversion, and um, the landing page, the sales page, was actually delivering almost twice as many conversions as um, as the home page because we were using the home page and yeah you can see that in in analytics really really well the difference one second have you tried with the same um, st the same elements but just in different order like to have two different sales page not the home page and a two different I mean two sale pages but just with the elements yeah we, we've tried with the changing the elements order, we tried with uh, different colors, and we tried also with different um, uh, photos. Because photos can be tricky sometimes, you know. Um, for instance, if you address women, it's really nice to have like family things, you know, like um, maybe uh, women with children and their, their husband next to them. It depends on, on the product, I mean. If it's guys, then it usually works with blonde girls, no discrimination, and BMWs, white BMWs, <laughs> more, speci more precisely. So we tested, yes, white BMWs, black BMWs, um, if it's a three se Series 3 or if it's a Series 7 or something like that. Uh, for Romanian market, it was Series 3, mostly, okay? And the white version of it. If you put also a blonde girl next to it, you get the, <laughs> the great success. <laughs> okay. Um, we tested also with colors of the button, you know, with a call to action. And, of course, it needs to be in the brand, um, in the brand colors. You know, because if you have like a pink logo and you put a red button and then green text around it, it it's, it's a total mess. Uh, but usually, yes, red, red buttons tend to perform better than uh, blue ones or green ones, but it's to be tested. Okay, so there's no generic recipe for everyone that I would say, yes, the blonde and the BMW would be a generic <laughs> recipe, I would say. Um, but uh, for instance, for, for tech products, it really worked, you know, like having small videos with demos of the product, what the product can do, except for, you know, the blonde ones. Uh, we had another question there. Why, why, not using the, uh, why not using the HubSpot to automate all the... Uh, yeah. Um, HubSpot is a good tool for automating. Uh, that's why I included automation, okay? And once you have a clear um, client uh, path, you know, and the sales funnel is well set up, then you can automate. Yes, yeah, yeah. And bounce lead pages, any of them, it's a great tool to start. Um, it depends which one you find like more suitable for, for your business. We are using lead pages in the agency, uh, but we've been working with uh, Unbounce as well. It's been really great, doing a great job. And you can see like really quickly which is the most successful variation and then test further, further down the line. Thank you. For, it's a great question. Thanks. Okay, last but not least, I would tap into the design part, especially for the tech products. Design and uh, UI and UX are really crucial into um, making that product appealing to the, um, to the end users. So I would suggest getting great designers in or 
you know, partnering with great designers and helping, uh, helping your business uh, scale more efficiently. Okay, once we have considered all these challenges, we will take a look at the market, okay? So we are making sure that our business is well prepared for going international, then we are looking at market potentials, and here we have a lot of data that is out there from PayPal that is working on international markets, from different um, other platforms that are providing such kinds of, uh, of data. And even Google, who we worked really closely with in our expert efforts, they provide a wide range of tools that we can use to understand better the markets that we want to address. Um, when considering the language in which we want to address our audiences, please keep in mind that English is soon to be off on second or third place, okay? You'll see that Chinese is approaching really, really quickly, yeah? So you might uh, try to, to consider some solutions in, in that area. Spanish has a quite big portion Okay, so if you are addressing the U.S. market, for instance, it's a good segmentation to work to get, uh, towards the Latinos, okay? Understanding the market seasonality also can influence your, your business. Uh, if we are talking about B2B, for instance, we see spikes um, actually uh, in the beginning of the year when budgets are approved you know, and people want to, to spend, they have the, the approval, they have the budget and the willingness to um, acquire business products. And when it comes to retail, well, you know, the seasonality is quite, uh, um, is quite normal as we see it today. What is really interesting is that no seasonality at all uh, is actually taking 64% of the total traffic. So that means having ongoing campaigns, ongoing pro promotions um, is actually ensuring more than half of the revenue that we are driving. So we don't need to wait for Black Friday to start selling. Okay, um, another thing when we are talking about payment methods, it's really important to consider what is the consumer behavior in specific markets, which forms of payments they are willing to, to use. Okay, in Romania, it's still 85%, it's cash, right? Cash on delivery, uh, but in different markets, um, you see PayPal or Alipay or equivalent is the most, uh, most used, followed by credit cards and debit cards. So make sure you are implemented these payment solutions in your uh, website. Talking about the Google tools, um, we are working closely with the, with the team from Google Romania and Google Dublin because R Dublin is like our uh, supporting uh, uh, team um, into delivering reports on specific markets in terms of what are the search volumes for your product. For instance, um, um, I was talking about this client, you know, who's doing website builders, free website builders. Um, we can get such kind of reports where we understand how much is the search volume, okay, what people are searching for your specific product or service. And you can see it like here on the queries. Um, then how many people are clicking on your ads so you can roughly know what, uh, what size of your business can be on that specific market what click-through rate you can have and what's the cost per click because this is a question we get very often how much is the click you know it's not the fish it's the click um, so yeah you can see various CPCs cost per click according to markets um, if in Romania for instance um, you pay 10 cents for a specific query in the UK or the US it can be 10 times the value, okay? Um, in the surrounding countries, like Moldova or Bulgaria, it's definitely gonna be cheaper than in Romania. It can be like eight cents or nine cents. Um, if we go 
more to the West, like France or Italy, it can be maybe twice the price that we are paying here in Romania, just to have like a rough estimate so you understand how, um, how markets are evolving. Okay, and the last thing that we are looking into is the ad depth, which is telling us how many people are advertising on those specific queries, on what people are searching, okay? And here we actually understand what competition is doing, if it's a high competing market or if it's low, okay? So we are looking at entry barriers into that market, we are looking at competition and we are looking at costs, related to the volumes that we can achieve. Further on, we understand the trends, what people are doing throughout the year, not just at a specific point. So not just how much is the click today. We are looking what is the, the trend, if it's up or down. And also, we can see the device trends. It's really important because mobile has been taking on a lot of traffic. In Romania at this point, it's about 80 to 85% mobile. So whatever development you're doing or whatever updates you're doing to the website, it needs to be mobile first, not responsive as we used to do it so far. I know your fellow colleagues from the development department will be okay, okay will do mobile, <laughs> they're not so into that. But um, this, is, this is the market and we need to be, um, to be suitable to um, address it accordingly. Okay, um, devices, you know, have been, have been changing. Mobile has been increasing really, really fast, like 70% year over year. Desktop has been decreasing people are shifting to the mobile, but still conversions happen more often on desktops than on mobile. Still mobile is increasing faster on conversion rates. We see a big difference from, from last year when it was for every conversion, like every conversion we got on mobile was like three times less than on desktop. Now it's like half conversion rate. And tablets are dying slowly, like really, really dying because traffic has dropped. Conversions are still the same, but it's on a, on a steady decrease. For computer software, the trends are a little bit, you know, upside down. So there's still a lot of traffic on desktops. A lot of uh, conversions are still happening on desktops. So not so much on mobile. And you can see also trends. You can use Google Trends and you can use Consumer Barometer from Google to understand all these, uh, these patterns. Just tap into Google Consumer Barometer and Google Trends and do some queries on your specific product or service and see all these data, how it's showing up. Okay, um, so when using consumer trends, you can also see the, the searches that people are doing re related to your product and to compare it with your competition, let's say. Okay, it's important before looking at the, uh, the markets, it's important to understand who is our digital buyer and to create personas, buying personas. So we know if it's the, uh, the technical director or if it's the CEO of the company or if it's a freelancer that is going to benefit from our tools. Okay, and to understand exactly the age, the behavior, um, how, how often he's coming online, uh, what that person is doing online so that we can better target that audience through relevant ads. Who in this room hate irrelevant ads? Okay, like everyone. Who in this room hates YouTube ads? <laughs> okay, so nobody should be doing YouTube ads. Sorry, Google, I, w I, I shouldn't say that. Um, we use a lot of YouTube ads for brand awareness, but if we do not target those ads 
properly, then they can get really annoying, you know? Because you go to YouTube, you want to listen to your favorite music, or maybe see a how-to video. You're home trying to cook dinner, you don't know really what to cook, you're searching on YouTube. And then there's, you know, this Pampers ads or whatever, and you don't even have kids. It's really, really annoying, okay? So the role of our agencies is coming with the right message to the right audience, and especially with digital, we can do that. Yes, and we can translate all this to your businesses so that it's relevant and it brings in business for you. Okay, um, we have, um, I don't know if you know this website, eMarketeer, it has great resources on how to advertise and they have these reports that you can uh, tap into for specific markets. It's really, really great. And coming back to, to Google tools, we use uh, this consumer barometer um, stats that give us um, different, um, different insights on what the digital buyer is doing on a specific market. So for instance, if I have a business and I want to, um, to advertise it on the UK market, I'm going to consumer barometer and for the UK market, I'm looking at the digital buyer in UK and see what devices he's using, what they are using it for, if it's for buying stuff or just for inspiration or for um, learning something new and so on and so forth. It's a great source of data, but it's not the only one, you know? It's good that it's free, it's out there. Just try to play a little bit with it and see, you know, what devices your users are using and what they are using it for. Okay, there's another great tool who's called uh, Global Market Finder. Uh, last week it was launched also in Romanian, so if you want to use it in Romanian, it's great. Um, you just enter your website over there and it scrolls actually your website and identifies three or four uh, verticals that your product uh, belongs to and then it suggests which are the best markets that you can um, you can advertise that product later on so it's global market finder google it it's gonna be the first link maybe you will see um, i entered here as an example our website and it just provided four areas like internet internet is quite wide so i would take that out it's pay-per-click marketing which is actually the type of marketing that we are doing search engine paid placement okay and mobile apps and add-ons i would also take this one out we are not really specific on mobile apps we are a digital agency and what it gives you further on it's the top three markets that you can, uh, you can address. And from here, you can just select the market and it will send you uh, via email further data about those markets. Okay, here is just generic information about the size of the market, the size of the cost per click, so much, how much is the fish, okay? And um, how it's ranking and what sort of budgets you would need to be relevant for that specific market. So for instance, for me as a marketing agency, to advertise on the US market, I would need about $46,000 per month in order to be visible on this market. So what, what I would need to do is either allocate this budget or try to be more specific and go to maybe some states not the whole United States, okay? Just to go to maybe New York, California, or Florida, which are the top three, generally. Or maybe just one specific state. We had clients for which we have run campaigns only for specific zip codes. So I get people living on this street will see my ads and only them. For instance, we were advertising um, evening gowns, ladies, you know, like beautiful evening dresses. And the client has been doing a lot of uh, PR with celebrities from Hollywood. 
and we were using the specific zip codes from Hollywood to find other, um, other celebrities that would be willing to pay for such dresses because they were quite expensive. They were uh, 1,000 euros and up. And by using both social media where we were promoting these PR articles and Google search for these specific zip codes, uh, we managed to increase sales significantly. The only issue was that the sizes, European sizes and the American sizes did not match, so we had a rough um, return rate of about 30%, which is a lot. Like when you do e-commerce, you try to keep that um, return rate below 10%. So 20% or 30% or even higher, it's, it's putting a lot of pressure on costs. Okay, So that, that was a challenge that they need to fix before you know, taking again on, on, the marketing, uh, on the marketing effort. OK, in terms of uh, marketing campaigns, uh, we have various solutions that we can address. And we as agencies, uh, we need to assess the client's needs and take them on this journey, understanding which markets are the best fit for them, what are the budgets that they need to allocate, and then translate everything into the types of campaigns that need to be run. I highly recommend, even if you're doing this by yourselves, in within your marketing department to separate your campaigns by country, especially from cost reasons, for cost reasons, because one, it's one thing to advertise in the US and another thing to advertise in Romania, for instance. Um, language, of course, it's also a matter that you need to fix between you know, um, each country. Then the campaign type, because we have multiple solutions. We can tap into Google search, or we can do remarketing. Do you, everybody knows what's remarketing? Those ads that are following you once you enter the specific website, OK? It's been calming down now with the GDPR and all these cookies policy, but still it's been widely used. And it's still performing well if used moderately, OK? Just like drink, you know, drinking responsibly, remarketing responsibly is also good for your uh, health. Then separating campaigns by product or service, it's really, really important to manage costs and to understand performance. And I would highly recommend using brand campaigns, especially if you're doing PR efforts or using multiple types of campaigns. Um, it will enhance your brand and it will help you at the end of the day uh, save money and be more visible. Shopping ads, if you're using physical products, are a key thing. Uh, you will see them rolling out in Romania this year as well. We didn't have it so far. So you might not have seen this type of ads by now. Um, but they are delivering great results for international markets and I would suggest you go with them. Also remarketing, as I mentioned earlier, it's a great complement to the search campaigns and I would say it's a must for any, anyone who's starting. Really, really careful with uh, ad copy. Ad copy can make a huge difference. Um, even, for instance, even if we are using the same English in US or the UK, it can make a, a difference. And here you can A-B test as, free, as freely as possible. We have also some suggestions here using numbers, because numbers catch your eyes really quickly. If it's price, or if it's a discount, or if it's a, a limited offer, it's really good to, to post it and use it in the ad copy. Using the keyword free, surprisingly, it's still really, really catchy. So ad free as much as possible. and. If, it's up, if it applies, of course. You cannot use it for, for, um, uh, for non-free products. Next day delivery. It's really, really important if you are doing this kind of uh, uh, delivery. It really helps increase conversion rates. USPs, using unique selling proposition 
within the tax ad, we've seen really, really good results and we highly encourage you because that's what we transfer in terms of value using caps, capped letters, okay? Writing with capital letters also makes the message more visible. It increases the CTR and boosts the campaign performance. Then call to actions. The CTA is a call to action uh, in which we actually tell the audience what we want them to do. If it's a sign up or if it's download our ebook or create an account or buy now, it's really important to be straightforward and tell the users what we want them to do within the platform. And last but not least, you using extensions. So those are the extra lines of text that we can add to our regular ads that make us more visible on the client's screens. Okay, you've, maybe you've seen on Google, some ads are smaller, some are larger. It's because of these extensions. They don't cost you more, so you just add them in the campaign and let the system um, do the trick. Okay, and last but not least, a small recap. We need to analyze, make sure we understand the target markets. Then uh, we build the digital personas, so really, really knowing who we are addressing the messages to and how we can better adapt our ad copy to those digital personas' wants and needs. Um, building really enticing ad copy and A-B testing between multiple variations. And last but not least, the mantra that we are using in digital is test, measure, and optimize. Testing is part of the, the process. Measuring, making sure that we know each step and how much we put in and how much we take out of, uh, of that uh, specific campaign and continuously optimizing the performance that we are uh, generating. And last but not least, um, if I were to leave you with a specific recipe of success, I would say that you need to, to have a mix of these activities on, on the slide. Uh, using pay-per-click to drive quick traffic, like get really fast response, but making sure that this budget is not too high or not too low, because if it's too high, then it will suck your business. You know, like in two months, you will not have, have the, the money to pay your salaries and uh, your um, developers and so on. But not too low that you will not have enough results to be able to understand the market and um, be able to tap into the potential, okay? So I would suggest maybe at least 1,000 clicks per month Okay, looking at specific markets, if I want to address the US, for instance, and it's $5 a click, then to have maybe the budget for at least 1,000 clicks. So that would be $5,000. And then using PR, we've seen really good results for businesses that besides the pay-per-click campaigns, they also did PR on TechCrunch or TechRadar on such kind of relevant websites, reviews, you know, on these kind of uh, platforms that um, actually recommend the product or uh, the software that you guys are developing. It really helps combined with social media or with, uh, with Google Ads. Last but not least, you know, the word of mouth is the greatest um, propeller of your service. So making sure that you have a good referral program and that you encourage your users to recommend you further on. Um, it's the cheapest and the best way to, to scale the product. Um, last but not least, I've seen trade shows um, and events doing a great job for tech products. So I encourage you to look into the most relevant events in your industry and try to be present, network, talk to the investors, and you know gather feedback as much as possible and make sure that you are on the right track. And um, community building would be the final aspect that 
actually should be taken into consideration from day one because we have the tools out there to build the community. We have newsletters, we have Facebook groups, we have uh, different websites where we can build communities and post, uh, post updates of our product. So um, having an integrated marketing plan and automate as much of it, you know, by using HubSpot or any other solutions, um, it will really help your, your product be visible on the long run and really scale as fast as possible. Okay, this would be it on my side. We'll be having questions, answers, if you want to dig into a more specific topic um, that I've covered so far, or if you have specific questions, feel free, raise your hand, and let's talk about it. Anyone? No? Nothing for Moldova? No? Uh, let me check the time. Oh, great. We still have two minutes. <laughs> so, um, no questions? Yes? Colleen. Congratulations for the presentation. Thank you very much for all the good info. My question is, do you have B2B clients on international markets and what marketing strategies work well for them to get leads for their B2B business? Thank you, that's a great question. Thank you for the feedback. Um, yes, we do have uh, B2B clients. Uh, we have um, clients selling software abroad and uh, they have a sales team and they are doing lead generation through digital. Um, the key factor was to have sales pages for their specific products and um, having a team of salespeople on that um, time timetable, you know, like the um, schedule, yeah. V? Um, it's not call center, it's sales team. What they, they call, yeah. Um, I mean, we're working on B2B mostly. I'm the biz dev in an outsourcing agency. Uh, I'm the biz dev in an outsourcing agency. And I do have um, experience with the call centers, the appointment settings and all the stuff. Usually the uh, sales team on the calls is not working that good for the B2B sales. Mostly that's the inbound lead generation, not the outbound calls or outbound emails with the, uh, with the sales agents. That's why, I mean, I had the same question. B2B is working like face-to-face -face meetings, conferences, events, but the sales team on the calls or emails or chats, uh, I'm not sure. You actually, you actually get the leads so people are contacting you through, so for instance, they, they look some, for something on Google, okay? They click your ads, they see your landing page, they fill in your, your form on the website, and then somebody from the clients, from our clients, is calling them back, setting up a meeting, a face-to-face -face meeting with, uh, with that specific person. It works well for insurance, it works well for uh, software solutions, um, it works for automotive, what we have tested, this kind of um, process. So basically the digital is like a 24-7 sales agent because it's preparing, it's heating the leads up and then there's the call center who's taking in the leads and providing further information and making the, the appointments for uh, the final person. It depends if the, um, uh, the product is a high value, then you can go and have face-to-face -face meetings. But if it's, it's a low volume, then the, the, the sale is happening on the, over the phone in the call center. Like if it's, um, I don't know, um, insurance thing of lower value. Um, Moldova. I mean, yeah. We're both in call centers and in uh, software outsourcing. Cost-wise, 
teams of salesperson or account managers who are warming up and setting the appointments or whatever. Cost-wise, uh, call center team, even in Moldova or Take it India or Philippines, whatever. It's 3.5 euro per hour, the, co the cost. Uh, Cost-wise and in, ter um, in terms of length and yield of the results, call center is not that effective than the inbound lead generation digital, building the communities, building the trustworthy resources, articles, whatever. So uh, th that's why I'm into the discussion because I've tried both. And uh, the, the call centers is not that working much for, especially for international markets. I mean, uh, US, UK market, you're trying to get some native speakers costs, usually for native speakers, even it's uh, Latin America or Filipino native speakers differs. If you're taking Moldova, we do have like uh, 30 call centers in Chisinau only with 300 people up who are working on US, Europe market or whatever. The cost is high. And the, the accents and the mentality and the cultural proximity is totally different. If we're talking like Europe, okay, not US, not UK. So, yeah. uh, We have our, our largest client, uh, which is in the US, and he's actually spending $1 million per month. Um, and it's in the insurance um, business. And they have like a whole army of salespeople, you know, over the phone. But yes, they're native Americans, so they're not using Filipinos and Indians and stuff. Uh, but they are using Google Ads, so every, all this budget is in Google Ads and, you know, just driving leads towards their um, sales team and the sales team actually closing the, the deals. It's always a question about the quality of the leads because us as marketeers, we can't really influence that quality of the leads. We are working mostly on, on the volumes. Of course, with the right ad copy and with A-B testing, you can up a little bit into the you know fine-tuning the, the leads but at the end of the day yes it's a it's a matter of costs and um, testing different um, approaches and see what works for you there's no gener generic recipe we also have a, another client in Germany for instance who are selling um, business services so each contract is like 1 million 1 million and a half euros so for them, it makes sense to advertise on Google for people who are searching for specific business uh, solutions that they are offering. They get leads in and they are calling those leads. And within six months, for instance, the, for the first test that we ran, they got a, a contract of $1 million with just investing up to $10,000. Okay, so for them, it was worth the cost. But it's really important to, to think about the, the length of your test. Because if you were to test only for three months, he wouldn't have got those, that, that one million contract. You know? So think about the, the sales funnel, the, the time it takes to take a decision. Because for business services, it may take up to six months okay, from, the, from the first contact. Because they need to visit each other to build that trust and everything to get everything approved by the finance manager the ceo and whatever okay so we need to to build on that and um, us as a digital agency we need to to reassure the client that at the end of the day it's gonna pay off all the effort and all the money they put into um, into building the landing pages into uh, giving the Google and the Facebook ads a chance and um, having the right strategy. I, even for us as agencies, it's, it's difficult in the first one or two months because we need to understand the business, we need to understand um, how the sales process is happening. So we become more like consultants for that business because you might come to us and say, I want Google Ads, but maybe Facebook Ads or Waze Ads or Twitter is working better for your type of business or LinkedIn if you're more on the B2B side. So it's just, and it's not just one platform at the end of the day. You might find that Google works for you really well, but people need to see you on various places in order to get that trust and start you know, doing what you want them to do. Did I answer your question? 
Okay, thank you. Anyone? No? So thank you so much. I really appreciate the time and the effort you put into coming here. Um, you can find me at Annabella at, at lemonade.com, on our website at lemonade.com or .row in Romania, on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and I'd be happy to take your questions if you want uh, in person after the workshop. Thank you so much and have a great day.